The Federal and Valevin Hypermarket jointly present the Tutukudi Marathon 2024 to raise awareness on drug abuse. The event is co-presented by Edison Cardio Care Centre Tiruchendur, powered by L. Anand Jewellery and St. Mother Teresa Engineering College, Tutukudi. Hello and welcome to The Federal. You're watching Off the Beaten Track, a program in which we take a holistic look at one of the major issues of the moment. Today, we will be talking about the American presidential election, which undoubtedly is one of the remaining most important events of the rest of the year. The Indian election happened a few months ago. Now, the election was going on very sedately till about a few weeks ago when the dramatic uh, you know, abdication by President uh, Joe Biden and thereafter everything changed to talk about the American presidential election as to how it will affect uh, the world, how it affects Indian policies and also what is the narrative now of the presidential election. I am joined by one of the most eminent international uh, observers and scholars of uh, India, which is C. Raja Mohan. He is, uh, you know, of course, being a veteran journalist and also currently the contributing editor to the Indian Express on International Affairs. He is also a visiting professor at the Institute of South Asian Studies in the National uh, University of Singapore. So welcome to this program, uh, Raja Mohan. And, uh, you know, uh, thank you very much for sparing time to talk to us on such an important issue. Uh, just a few weeks, uh, you know, a uh, few days after, in fact, you know, of President Biden's withdrawal, you had actually uh, written an article in the Indian Express where you see it said that it, you know, till about a, barely a few days ago, the to quote you, that it seemed to be herald a boring battle between two old white men, Trump and Biden, and that they were going to be repeating their 2020 campaign. Things have changed. What kind of changes have happened? What are the issues which have now come up? And can we actually say, from being an individual-centric election, uh, focused more on the physical and mental abilities of one of the candidates, now we are having a direct issue based election i think the the big change uh, uh, before that uh, thank you for you know having me here on this discussion thank you uh, the the big change is the extraordinary enthusiasm in the democratic party uh, the democratic party its activists its leaders were really despondent uh, that uh, they had biden who was really they knew he was not really physically all there uh, but he was not stepping down and uh, everyone saw it in the debate. Uh, so they were really, uh, you know, frustrated that uh, this was a lost race. But the moment you had uh, a different person in the race, uh, that's Kamala Harris, and then I think it's really, uh, really produced, is, is producing great enthusiasm within the party cadres uh, and suddenly the rejuvenation of, of the Democratic Party and, and they're all out now. Uh, they see already in the last uh, few weeks, uh, she's gained ground across the country. Uh, she's also inched very close to Trump in the so-called battleground states uh, in the in the in the Midwest. So, so I think it, things are looking very very good for for her at this stage. Second, I think one of the paradoxes is if Biden had stepped aside one year ago and said, "Look, it's open. Everybody is free to contest uh, for who wants to be the president uh, presidential candidate." in the Democratic Party, uh, it would have been a tough contest for uh, Kamala Harris to get through. Uh, but because it was done at the last minute, uh, there was very little room in terms of time uh, to organize a fresh election. Uh, so I think uh, she was crowned immediately. The party rallied behind her. Uh, and her performance has been quite impressive. Uh, she speaks well. Uh, she's quite focused uh, and uh, quite tough uh, in responding to the Republican attacks. So I think things have worked out very well for her personally and for the Democratic Party. Uh, on the age issue, now the age issue has turned on Trump. It's right. one thing for Trump, uh, who was three years younger than Biden, uh, to say the other guy was not all there and he was quite quite good. And now Trump looks like he's rambling. Uh, you know, he can't maintain focus. So in a way, the age question has turned in favor of Kamala Harris and not but I think uh, we should not rush to a conclusion. There's still nearly 90 days to go. So at this point, 
uh, it is uh, Kamala is having a good time, and the next week's convention uh, will give her a big boost as well. So the next few days, you'll see uh, Kamala Harris uh, going up, uh, and the entire liberal media establishment really boosting her uh, to to raring for her to to go out and defeat uh, Trump. So, but I would say in the end, uh, the contest will be quite a close one uh, because mm -hmm. we've seen in the last few elections in 2016 in 2020. Uh, things things are very close and uh, the battle really comes down to a few states uh, which are uh, the so-called swing states uh, right. where i think uh, winning those states becomes crucial uh, and uh, uh, you can win new york with 90 percent of the vote but in the end it doesn't make a difference in the electoral college system that the that these right. americans have but she's doing well in, the, in those states and i would say the the basic issues have not changed mm -hmm the immigration issue uh, the illegal immigration question is very very toxic and there trump i think is taking strong positions uh, sections of his party uh, want illegal immigrants to be deported while the democrats uh, when biden administration came to power they were into this very liberal mode of saying borders don't matter everybody is welcome uh, and they're going to put up people they put up people uh, in hotels in downtown uh, in many many so-called sanctuary uh, sanctuary cities mm -hmm. there is a backlash uh, against the kind of treatment that the immigrant illegal immigrants are getting uh, so i think it remains to be seen how this issue plays out uh, i think what the democrats have done is they kind of softened or hardened depending on what you say they're looking a little tougher on immigration than the kind of extreme liberal position uh, everybody's welcome uh, into the into the us the economy uh, is uh, is of course is always a major issue uh, and there, I think uh, the question of inflation uh, is is will be worrying for Kamala Harris. Uh, and the, uh, the and on the economic related issues, uh, Trump has a very very hard line on trade. Uh, so therefore, uh, the Democrats will have to match it because their instincts have been for a more liberal global order on economics. But under Biden, we saw they've already moved closer to the Trump positions. So I think on that, Kamala Harris is unlikely to challenge uh, the, the, the opposition to free trade, especially uh, in the battleground states. The princess to foreign policy, uh, I think there, there again, uh, barring the question of alliances, uh, Trump thinks alliances are bad and that they're free riders on American security, American money. Uh, barring that question, I think on the China, China question, there is significant convergence between the two parties. Uh, on the need for a strong defense both sides are almost on the same side uh, and the need to uh, uh, ensure america's number one position now there are no no differences but it's only the question of means by which american hegemony uh, to be sustained i think those are the uh, issues uh, i would say broadly the three broad uh, areas of uh, in which actually the, the on the economics uh, i mean domestic economic issues and uh, Hmm. Uh, immigration are where some of the contest uh, is taking place. Uh, you know, talking about international issues, what about the two wars? You know, we have the situation in Ukraine and we have the situation in West Asia involving Gaza and Israel. So, you know, where exactly are the two differing, if they are at all? Yeah, I think on Ukraine, there's been over the last one year, there's been strong opposition uh, to giving more and more aid to uh, Ukraine while the Democrats were pressing to continue the policy. Uh, and I think Trump, of course, says, look, if he was the president, the Russians wouldn't have dared to invade Ukraine. Uh, I think uh, while he's sympathetic to the argument that the US should not continue to supply to Ukraine, uh, he's taking the position, uh, if he's elected to power, he can force a peace agreement very quickly. That is, he has the leverage uh, and the weight uh, to tell both Russians and Ukrainians to come to the negotiating table. Uh, on the uh, Democratic side, I think she will largely continue with Biden's policy of supporting Ukraine uh, and its, uh, and its uh, sovereignty. Uh, so, so I would say there is clear some difference here, uh, but uh, it's really uh, uh, Biden uh, and Harris, I think, uh, largely will uh, continue the same, same course. On the question of Gaza, I think uh, while the Republicans are solidly behind Israel, uh, you have actually uh, within the Democratic Party, uh, large sections of the left, uh, very, very critical of the Biden administration's policy. Uh, 
uh, in fact, if you want to hear a new slogan uh, that, uh, uh, what is this, uh, something about Kamala Harris uh, supporting genocide and you can't hide, uh, that is the new slogan. Uh, so there is parties radicals as well as the large Muslim community in the US, which is very well organized. Uh, right. they're not and they're, some of them are concentrated in states like Michigan, where they can now uh, have some electoral uh, electoral impact. Uh, so the the left and the and the uh, uh, Muslim groups. I mean, I think they're putting a lot of pressure. Uh, some people think uh, in the convention itself, uh, you might see a lot of uh, protests on the Palestine question uh, by the by the liberal activists. And how far it will go, whether they'll be uh, extremely uh, you know, violent. Uh, it's something, of course, Democratic Party has a long tradition. Uh, in fact, in mm -hmm. 1968, uh, Chicago Convention, uh, there were yes. riots yes. and uh, all kinds of things happened. Uh, I don't see that kind of situation. But I think the pressure from the left and the uh, Islamic voters uh, to, to, to pressurize the, uh, the Democratic Party to take more critical positions of Israel. Uh, President Biden had completely identified himself with Israel was unwilling to put pressure on uh, on uh, on uh, Netanyahu, uh, while Kamala Harris, uh, you know, in a meeting with Netanyahu a few few days ago in Washington, uh, she at least was sounding, uh, you know, look, uh, violence must stop, ceasefire. So she was a little more assertive, uh, but but she can't disown Biden's policy. So I think she she's being very careful in uh, taking a position. So she can't go completely. Uh, with the left position, uh, she can't disown Biden's position. So I think she'll try and differentiate herself a little bit uh, from the Biden position of total support for Israel, uh, with uh, a, a somewhat of a critical uh, position against Israel, but at the same time uh, affirming uh, the deep commitment to defend Israel. And, and now the gathering war clouds in the Gulf, uh, that I think uh, I don't think she has much choice uh, or an option to abandon Israel. So I think right. that will be some tension in Chicago. It has to be some kind of a balance. You know, you know, there is one point, you know, which a lot of uh, people are saying and also writing that uh, Trump is running against uh, Kamala Harris. But it appears from his campaign and what he's speaking that he's still fighting against Biden. You know, even the much publicized campaign, uh, the conversation which happened with Elon Musk on uh, uh, on X, which used to be Twitter till uh, a few months back, even that was actually full of rhetoric against Biden. So is Trump facing the, uh, you know, is unable to understand uh, the, what should be the real nature of his campaign against uh, Harris? You know, he still seems to be stuck in the anti-Biden groove. Yeah, I mean, I think quite clearly he would have loved to fight Biden. It looked like they were winning against Biden. Right. So he misses Biden. But the fact is, Biden is no longer the candidate. Uh, and I think uh, the initial attacks the, he and the Republican Party had mounted against a couple of Harris have backfired. Uh, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't rule them out to come up with new tricks. Uh, I think the party is surprised. They thought if Biden was removed as candidate, there would be serious uh, challenges in the Democratic Party. It didn't happen. The party rallied behind Kamala Harris very quickly. So the Republicans have a problem now. In, uh, how do you deal with a candidate? In a sense, it was, uh, the Democrats are lucky to have a surprise new candidate. Suddenly, uh, you think you're playing against uh, one guy on the other side. The guy, there's a different guy, a different lady uh, in the contest. Uh, so I think it's really for them adjusting to the new situation has been hard. But I would say don't give them up. Don't give up. I mean, uh, there's a few more weeks to go, uh, and the Republican machine, I'm sure, uh, will come up with uh, new attacks. But but. Uh, they're going to lose some valuable time. As we said, look, the next few days, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Kamala Harris is going to get a big bump. And then the challenge of uh, you know, bringing her down would be harder for Trump and the Republican Party. You know, what about Trump, Trump's attempt to portray uh, Kamala Harris as, you know, he's using words like left, radical, loony. Those are the kind of personalized attacks which is meeting, not really uh, attacking the issue that she is advocating. Uh, of course, it's a different thing that you know. Even now, the full, you know, set of issues on which she's going to be contesting is not yet very clear. She's not come up with what we in India would call, you know, with a kind of a manifesto, uh, which we would be able to understand better. 
but so is is really uh, trump uh, struggling as we were talking about look i think uh, it's been a conventional line of attack by the republicans against most democratic candidates that they're too liberal uh, that they tax and spend right. uh, they too culturally uh, become woke uh, and and uh, that they are uh, they don't understand the middle america uh, and and therefore they're imposing uh, their values on uh, on the on the heartland uh, especially uh, the 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 mid midwest midwest and and the south uh, uh, where the whites are still a, a majority uh, so the but the the challenge uh, of course what he's doing is since uh, kamala harris is from california and california is seen as uh, even extremely liberal so i think they calling a, not only radical but as a san francisco radical uh, which has a kind of a connotation in the heartland uh, that really are being an extremist uh, in in terms of uh, liberal uh, liberal views so so far this is uh, historically in the last many years being a liberal was a liability uh, in the us elections hmm. uh, and uh, and one reason why kamala harris is moving closer to the center Uh, is really to show that she is not a uh, crazy liberal that she is willing to take hard okay. positions on a number of issues so she will make some movement to the to the center uh, but mm -hmm. uh, these people republicans will try and make that stick look she is extreme she is liberal uh, she impose woke values on uh, uh, ordinary people uh, that will be a big big attack point uh, through the campaign uh, i suspect okay you know the article which you wrote in the indian express you know right after trump uh, after biden abdicated uh, the uh, being the candidate you very well explained uh, harris's uh, you know background personal background her african and asian uh, lineage you also talked about as to how uh, you know through her college she went to a university which is actually uh, known for uh, you know black uh, one of the most prestigious black universities uh, you also said you know that you know, talked about the the american the sororities you know which we really don't understand in indian politics you know so would that now you know as you said that she is trying to be less of a liberal so would her background as a combination of all this african asian black radical politics all that mix and get uh, you know work against her no i think uh, given a background you know it a black university uh, and before that uh, her mother uh, and her father was uh, was a black and they were growing up in california she was associated with many of the radical movements uh, so in a way by going to black college uh, and to uh, being part of the historic black sororities uh, sororities and fraternities are not common in our colleges but they're very central to american uh, college yes. life so i think what she has done is uh, she's really consolidated the black vote but right. it looked like uh, if biden was the candidate it, the, the response would have been probably a lot less enthusiastic so in a way she's really activated uh, the, uh, the the black uh, uh, vote which is quite critical uh, in in many parts of the country and at the same time uh, many of the indians and south asians as well i mean certainly will identify themselves with her uh, although she's careful not to advertise the Uh, too much of a you know indian heritage uh, you saw one of the attacks on her was uh, trump saying oh she was actually she's an indian but she's claiming to be a black uh, right. so but in respect of what trump will say uh, for south asians for indians certainly uh, she is really it's really uh, reaching the pinnacle uh, of the american political power my sense is uh, uh, many of them are also very wary of the republican right wing which tends to be a more racial in its uh, orientation while those the well heeled indians will find the republican party with its low taxation uh, anti illegal immigration also appeals to some indians who are really the upper, upper bracket but but i would say uh, historically most indians have voted with the democrats and i suspect kamala harris yeah. will consolidate uh, that as well so her struggle is really to win the white working class uh, i think that's where Uh, she has to make that pitch uh, to say that look she's going to fight for them uh, and she's not a crazy liberal and i think this where what biden did in the last election really emphasize the question of uh, american middle class uh, supporting them against the uh, you know rapacious capitalism in the us bring down drug price drug prices so i think some of that is what we're going to see play out i think 
where she will try and uh, reach out. Because that is the really the critical vote that is in the Midwest, the white working class, uh, which is not doing well. Uh, thanks to the globalization and the deindustrialization, uh, they're in a bad shape. And I think winning those votes uh, is the is the key. And I think the Biden administration, in fact, one reason why the Biden administration walked away from globalization, uh, focused on industrial policy, domestic manufacturing, was really to get back to the classical working class base that the Democrats have had. So I think she has to find a way to get that back. Uh, we saw uh, at the Republican convention, one of the trade union, major trade union leaders was present there. But now, since then, she's a candidate. So my suspect uh, the working class will demand things from her. And I'm sure uh, she'll try and accommodate as many of the demands. So you're going to see uh, she's making a big, big pitch to the to the white working class. Right. You know, uh, there is one more issue in about this entire election, even when uh, Joe Biden was there in the race, which we never really understood because we possibly don't understand the American legal system so well. It's slightly different from that in India. That are those cases and the investigations which are going on against Trump regarding as to how he tried to overturn the 2020 uh, verdict. Now, all these things, can you just take us through this and whether it is going to play any significant role in this election in all the cases, you know, if there was any Indian candidate in an election with all the kind of charges which we kind of read, it would have been very difficult for that candidate to get a you know fighting chance. But here it appears that it's, it simply is not being regarded by the voters. If, if that is the case, then why? Look, I think the, the Republican Party's base sees... Uh, the many of these cases put against him were part of a political vendetta by the by the Democratic Party. Okay. Uh, the Democrats can say, "Look, uh, he led an insurrection," mm -hmm. uh, but for the, uh, the Republicans feel that Biden stole the election. That the Democrats stole the election. So what seems to be no since we read mostly the liberal press, uh, we don't understand the uh, right wing sentiment. That the U.S. is deeply divided, and uh, this notion, uh, this you know, the fact that uh, the guy who was the presidential candidate for two terms, and the courts is slapping cases against him, and if you do that in India, you say that is that is clearly a political machination by the ruling party. We've seen that uh, happen in in our country. So this yes. you know, dumping cases. Uh, there's a lot of legal criticism of the manner in which some of these convictions have been made. Uh, purely legal arguments, not uh, political arguments. So I think a lot of the Republicans see this as a political uh, campaign rather than uh, that he's a genuine uh, criminal. So they can keep saying he's a felon, he's a criminal, but I don't think that cuts ties with uh, much of his much of his base. But the the legal process is still on, uh, and but the Democrats also know if they're doing well to force him, uh, you know, a legal base of. Fixing his candidate at this point would actually be rebound, which makes the country far more divided. Uh, so if they're on a winning wicket, uh, I doubt if they'll force the issue. And the, in any case, the courts have suspended some. The issues are being question of how much presidential immunity there is. So I think that, that danger, I think, has passed. That election will not be decided by politics, but by courts. Uh, that, I think, has been deferred. Uh, so if Trump wins, uh, then the question will, might come up later, but at this point, I suspect uh, it is going to be a proper electoral fight, uh, and the legal part uh, is in suspended animation. That doesn't mean it hasn't gone yet. Right. There is going to be many more hearings in the in the coming weeks. Yeah. You know, when you were explaining about uh, uh, you know the Democratic uh, Party, you know, not really being very keen to try to speed up the legal cases against Trump, I kind of got reminded of you know situation in India around. 2014, you know, when uh, there was a virtual campaign, you know, even on those lines, Mr. Modi during the, the campaign would say, you know, that there were all kinds of false cases which had been filed against him by the previous government against him and his associates, specifically Mr. Amit Shah was talking about. I got reminded of that, you know, the India factor, you know, which actually brings me to something which I've actually noticed, you know, primarily because of tracking Mr. Modi's uh, initiatives and politics with the Indian diaspora to whichever part of the world he's gone to, specifically the US. I have noticed this very peculiar paradoxical situation where a large number of people within the Indian diaspora in the United States 
are actually supporters of the Democratic Party, but when it comes to domestic Indian politics, they tend to look at Mr. Modi as a great savior of the Indian state and, uh, you know, you know, increasing India's prestige in the international order. You know, how do you look at this? Uh, you know, do you have any views on this? Look, I think the U.S. Firstly, I think the U.S. process gets to be far more political. Uh, in a way, the unlike in India, uh, where the process, you know, there is a seeming neutrality uh, of the judicial process. Uh, but in the U.S., the prosecutors are elected. Uh, the state governments, uh, you know, have a lot of political leaders. The elected governments have a lot of power in shaping uh, prosecution. Uh, rather than an independent uh, judiciary. So I think it's a far more vulnerable to political uh, manipulation than when Indian case to the politics the media it's in a, in a different way, but there it can be much more direct as we saw in the New York, uh, which is well known, uh, shall we say, a, a democratic uh, state where the whole process uh, was actually aimed at uh, uh, muddying uh, Mr. Trump's name. So, so, so I would say, look, I think most Democrats, uh, you know, most Indians, uh, they're both Americans and Indians. And I think that's where, when it comes to uh, the Indian uh, issues, uh, the patriotism, a sense of uh, loyalty to the Indian state, that tends to dominate. But I, I wouldn't say it's entirely. Uh, much of the criticism of the Modi government in the US is also led by uh, the Indians, uh, academics, Indian scholars, the Indian liberals. Today, there's a fairly large uh, Indian liberal uh, establishment in you know which sits in all the universities which is uh, activist in fact today uh, Indians are you know at Biden administration alone it's almost uh, 200 yes, or, uh, Indian yes. Americans in really high, really high position so so I think I don't think it's a general thing that's what you hear more because they're organized but but uh, it's I, I would say uh, they're as divided uh, and the the urban uh, university-centered, professional-centered, uh, middle-class Indians in the U.S. tend to be uh, quite quite critical of uh, India uh, and its policies these days. Uh, what about the two vice presidential picks of both uh, Trump and uh, Harris? You know, what are your views on who they have selected to run as a running mate? Yeah, I think what's interesting is both of them seem to have doubled down on a on a candidate who is like them, rather than find balancing the ticket. Uh, I think Trump's choice of Vance uh, uh, is really Vance is really uh, the kind of right wing voice for the future. Uh, in fact, much more uh, visceral in expressing uh, the questions on illegal migration against woke politics than Trump. Uh, so he chose him rather than someone who would be slightly to the closer to the center would have got greater balance to the ticket. Uh, Kamala Harris seems to have done the same thing. A lot of people were expecting her to choose uh, one of the governors, George Shapiro, uh, who was seen as a more centrist uh, and would have given her the wider base. But instead, she chose a liberal from Minnesota uh, who is actually uh, as liberal as her. Uh, so I think their sense consolidating their own uh, base seems to be more important uh, than uh, you know reaching out to a, a wider section. So. Uh, that's where it is. Uh, I think uh, my sense is uh, both the candidates uh, are gotten, getting into trouble. As you know, in the US, um, mm -hmm. you know, throwing mud on the candidates is a part of a very established, professional, uh, you know, serious business. I mean, uh, and you see both sides, somebody is pulling out old college pictures of each side and saying, look, this guy was crazy. Uh, so all that will happen. Uh, but my sense is in the end, it's really the two presidential candidates that matter. That's what is good to matter most. You know, one last question, you know, how about New Delhi? You know, how is New Delhi, do you think, is looking at it? And uh, how confident are you that they will be able to work with whoever is a new president, regardless of who gets in it? No, no, I have no doubt uh, that we will be able to deal with whoever is in power. We means the Indian government. Uh, because I think uh, over the last 20 years, if you see since, uh, not 24 years, I would say, uh, since President Clinton came to India in March 20, yes. 2000, yes. Uh, that was the last year of his presidency. Uh, since then, we've had, uh, we had George W. Bush, we had Obama eight years, George W. Bush eight years, Obama yes. eight years, uh, Trump four years, Biden four years. Now, all these guys, I mean, we've seen the relationship go up and up and up across the board. 
between all these all these uh, administrations. Uh, so I think uh, we have actually a fairly a, a broad bipartisan consensus in the United States on the importance of the relationship with India uh, and uh, India, Indian Foreign Office, Indian uh, National Bureaucracy, Security Bureaucracy has dealt with senior decision makers in both the parties. So uh, whoever occupies uh, the positions, I think uh, India would be quite familiar with them. Uh, so, so I would say India is probably uh, the best placed major country outside the US uh, mm -hmm. that can cope with this because Europeans are mortified uh, the prospect of Trump coming back. Uh, some of the Asian allies of uh, US are mortified at the, at the uh, fear of uh, Trump uh, abandoning them uh, to China. Uh, so, so I would say uh, India is probably a better place than most of the friends and partners of the uh, of the United States. And I think the experience of the last 20 years uh, has really put India in a, in a good place. And I think in India too, uh, you would know, I mean, you've seen, you covered this uh, starting from Narasimha Rao uh, to Atal Bihari Vajpayee to Manmohan Singh uh, and to Prime Minister Narendra Modi. I, mean, I think if there's one issue uh, on which they've all agreed, despite the constant noise against the relationship, uh, that all of them uh, in a consistent manner advance the relationship. Uh, and yes. I think contrary to the uh, constant pessimism about the relationship, uh, today there's one thing that has really transformed in the last 20 years. It's really the India-US relationship in terms of trade, in terms of technology, in terms of uh, movement of people. Uh, today, I think the US has emerged as the biggest uh, partner for India. So while there's always this noise, uh, Americans are doing something, you know, uh, both on the right and the left. Uh, you've seen this most recently in the case of Bangladesh. But the solid relationship between the two systems has become very, very solid. And I don't see that shaking or changing in any manner uh, in the next four years. Well, thank you very much, uh, Raja Mohan, for, uh, you know, very ably and very adroitly taking us through this entire set of issues. Uh, it is, of course, still three months. Uh, there will be many changes. There will be many twists and turns. We will uh, track these and we'll hope that if things really get very complicated, where it requires a fresh insight from you, we will definitely bother you and hope to get you on the show once again. Thank you very much, Adam. The Federal and Vale of Wind Hypermarket jointly present the Tutukudi Marathon 2024 to raise awareness on drug abuse. The event is co-presented by Edison Cardio Care Centre Tiruchendur, powered by L. Anand Jewellery and St. Mother Teresa Engineering College, Tutukudi.